Good morning, everyone. Please stand for the King's Anthem. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, I would like to call our ISB headmistress, Kun Usa Sambun, to the stage. Sawadee ka. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Today is one of those rare, very special days at ISB when we'll have the privilege to listen to and interact with a person who has contributed enormously to the progress of the mankind. Samya Sharma will introduce Dr. Elbrade in a few moments, but before that, I have a few words to say about the uh, event itself. We are honored to be part of the ASEAN Bridges series that the International, International Peace Foundation has continuously hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, Cambodia, and more recently, Vietnam since 2003. At ISB, we have play proud host to Professor Harao Zuhausen, Professor Romano Prodi, and most recently, Professor Brian Schmidt. The aim of the bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faith, as well as with people in other parts of the world to promote understanding and trust. As an internet school that is strongly committed to global citizenship, we are honored to be hosting Dr. Mohammed al Baradai and to be part of the International Peace Foundation's work with around one million students now studying in internet school across the world the equivalent of a school system in a small country. Internet schools are the embodiment of the promotion of understanding and trust. With any, without any further ado, I will now turn to you over to Samya um, Sharma, who introduced our distinguished guest, Samya. Thank you, Queen USA, for that wonderful introduction. It's my honor to introduce our Nobel laureate, Dr. Mohammed al Baradai. Dr. Mohammed al Baradai was the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, 
from 1997 to 2009, who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005 for his efforts to prevent nuclear energy from being used for military purposes and to ensure that nuclear energy for peaceful purposes is used in the safest way possible. Throughout his career, among others at the United Nations and the World Health Organization, Dr. Elbor Adai made it a priority to promote the peaceful uses of nuclear power, striving to make radiation therapy available in less developed countries for the treatment of diseases such as cancer and malaria. Dr. Elbor Adai also has a real interest in how the world can be a more secure and equitable place. At this time, please help me welcome Dr. Elbor Adai to ISB. Good morning. Samia and Christina were saying that they were nervous walking with me. And I didn't want to tell them that I was nervous walking with them. Because you, I get very nervous when I come to talk to young people. Because you are very smart. And the questions you usually have are quite difficult to answer. I know, th I know that from my granddaughters. I have two who are seven and five. And they usually ask me very difficult questions. So I can, I can handle older people. But you are the younger generation. And you have grown up in a different environment. And I'm here basically to talk with you how we can together but primarily you, make our world a better place. Each one of you, I'm sure, ask himself or herself, what do I want to do when I grow up? But part of that, you know, what kind of environment I want to live in? You know, what is really important for you? Is it fairness? Is it justice? Is it having health care? Is it having good education? Uh, is it being you know, at ease with everybody, whether he is black or white, speak Malay or, or Arabic? You are all coming from an international school, so you are quite familiar with a, the so-called melting pot. You know, basically, people from all sorts of ethnicity, race, language, colors, working together. And of course, you discover right away that this is what we are. We are all one human family. We don't bite of each other, you know, if we speak different language or if we have a different skin color or ethnicity. These are quite superficial, as you understand when you, when you see it. But are we, are we are in a good shape in the, in the world today? My views at that we are not, you know, because we have a lot of the most important problem I think we're facing that is poverty. You know, uh, we still have a lot of poverty around the world, and what makes it worse that it is not that we don't have the money to make everybody have enough to eat. It's just we send the money in the wrong in the wrong directions. Uh, you have to probably, I'm sure you know that we have like 900 million people who go to bed hungry every night. That's terrible. And it is not at all that we cannot feed them because we can feed these 900 million people if we spend 1% of what we spent on armament on feeding these people. This sounds crazy, but it just gives you an idea of how crazy sometimes we treat basic values, you know. Because if we don't get everybody enough to eat, if we don't get everybody health care, things we take for granted ourselves, you know, uh, then how do we expect people to react? I mean, we see now a lot of complaints about extremism, about terrorism which is terrible. But do we ask ourselves why 
we end up with this kind of environment? Why do we end up with a lot of people, you know, acting in an extremist way or angry? Yeah, if you go then and look at how they live, and they see how are they treated, how are they persecuted, how they don't have access to medical care, how they have a government that is treating them very badly, denying them their rights, freedom of expression, freedom of belief. So I always ask that it's not only that we should talk about the symptoms, you know, oh my God, that there is extremist group here. It's bad, of course it's very bad. But in order to address this, it is not through the use of force. It's through that creating a different environment when everybody feels that she or he has her own dignity. I think the key issue we need all to work for is make, how to make sure that everybody enjoys human dignity. And human dignity is, is not just food on the table, it's not just health care, but to be free to express his or her views, to be free to worship whatever she or he wants to worship. Uh, these are, so you wake up in the morning and you feel that you are being treated as human being. You know? And I always say, if we, if we treat everybody as a human being, he will, or she will act as human being, you know. And if we don't, then don't be, don't, shouldn't be surprised if some of them do not act as human beings. So what do we want? We basically want something very simple. We want to live in peace. Uh, meaning what? Meaning that we don't kill each other. That we treat each other fairly. That it, we treat each other that we have compassion for each other. Then when you see your neighbor who doesn't have enough to eat, we go out of our way to help him or her. If we see people who do not have medical care, and lots of them are dying because they don't have access to medication, because medication is expensive. These are issues, of course, you and I are privileged people. We don't see it, or you don't see it. I do see it, but simply observe it. I don't experience it, but I see it. And you come to, as you grow older, you understand that you can't really feel good about yourself if you know that a lot of people are, do not have enough to eat or do not have health care, or that children are stunted, like in North Korea, when you have like 60% of children under two are stunted because of malnutrition. How do we feel good about ourselves? Uh, these are, you know, or, or we know that we, we, we spent last year, for example, on pet, shop, pet product, food for cats, our cats and dogs. And I had a dog for many years, so it's not, don't mis misunderstand me. But we spent like last year in the United States alone, $95 billion, you know, on pet product. And we spent on overall development to developing countries, blah, 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 130 billion, you know. So we spent as much, even globally, even more probably, on pets that we spend on human beings. If that's a right priority, if that's how we feel good about ourselves. And as I said, it's not a question, don't get anybody to convince you that we don't have the money. We have a lot of money. It's not, it's only a question of priorities. As I said, last year we spent $1.7 trillion on armament. I need 1% of that to make everybody have enough to eat. Another probably 1% to make sure that people have access to health care. You know, probably another 1% or 2% to have, to have everybody goes to schools get quality education. Yeah. And we are not getting that. But are we, are we secure? Do we feel that we are, look around the world, I mean, the number of wars going on, you know, and for what? Do we get any peace after the war? It gets worse. If you look at any of the issues that has been around us, Iraq for 10 years is 
is not getting any better. Afghanistan is not getting any better. I mean, conflicts are not, do not improve with time. They get worse. The only way to settle these issues is to do what you do when you have a fight with your at class or at, at, at home, is sit and talk to each other and try to find out what is, what's really the problem. How can we solve the problem? And it is never always as we know. One person is 100% right, 100% wrong. We are usually both right or usually both wrong. But talking to each other is, is the only way to do it. And bringing our humanity to the surface, our compassion, our solidarity, you know. And that's, I think, is, is basically what the message I want to leave with you. You need to create a world when you grow up based on human solidarity, understanding that whether you come from any part of the world, you are part of the same human family. You have the same hopes, the same aspiration. If I ask any one of you here, you have exactly the same hopes, same aspiration. And the basically, I want to have my, live my life, and I want to live my life in dignity, and I want to work as part of a larger community. So we can create a better world, a safer world, a more compassionate world. These are not difficult issues, but for you, it's unfortunately difficult issues for older generation. I don't think we have done very much for you. So, and therefore, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you here, because you are the, you are the future. You are the one who are going to make a difference in our world. And I do not want you to continue you know, business as usual, because business as usual is no good. Again, it's a pleasure for me, and I'll be very happy to answer any of your questions, the ones I can answer at least. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. al -Baradai. We will now open the floor to questions from the student body. Mr. Taig, can you please direct the first student to the microphone? Hi. Um, all of us have probably been inspired by someone. Who has inspired you to be who you are today? I can't hear you very well. Who has inspired you to be who you are today? Yeah, come <laughs> the question, as you heard, is who inspire me? You get, I think you do not get inspired by just one person. You get inspired by all different experience you go you see through life. I mean, you meet people, they impress you because they are honest, because they are hardworking, because they are sacrificing their life for, for their families. So I had, I had lots of people to inspire me, not necessarily famous people, not necessarily, you know, but just some, many, in many cases, simple people who are struggling to make ends meet, you know, and no. You know, you see that and you, you decide that your life has to have a meaning. You know, it's not just that I have an, a nice car, a nice house, and, but you, to have a meaning to your life, you have to feel that you are able to give. You know. And I think to me, at least, that's, you know, that's the, the most pleasure uh, is, is when you try to help somebody. Uh, I, rem I always remember a saying by, or a prayer by St. Francis of Assisi, you know, uh, and he who is saying, it's only by giving that you receive. And I think that is very true to me. You know, it's, it's a fact that you, you feel fulfilled when you, when you are able to help people, people who are in need. And you do it, you don't do it because you want a reward for it, you do it because you are a human being. Thanks. 
Thank you. In this auditorium, there are 12, 13, 14 year olds. So my question is, what were you doing at our age? I was fooling around like you are. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do at your, well, 13 and 14, that's a long time ago. Let me try to remember. <laughs> well, I used to play a lot of sport. And I, I used to play squash I enjoy, and swim. I used to tease my brothers and sisters a lot. Uh, I got in trouble with my parents a lot because of that. Uh, I enjoyed reading. You know, you know, and of course I enjoyed having friends. I mean, you learn through interacting with each other. You know, and having close friends, I think, is is an absolutely key. Having a healthy, you know, family relationship with your parents is also very important. But at the end of the day, you have to think for yourself. You listen to everybody, and when you absorb what you hear, what you read, but at the end. You have to make your own mind. But don't ever be stubborn, because we, none of us always has the ultimate truth. You know. We always learn. We always discover something new. You know, and uh, so I, you know, of course, I wanted you to always be, have an be an independent thinker, you know, and don't be influenced by other people. You know, you, you, you can listen to them, but you, you are a unique person. Every one of us is unique, and everyone has his own identity and his own way of looking at things. Uh, so enjoy yourself, but do as much playing as, as you could, sports, uh, but, but also try to work hard because to make a good career for yourself. And the career is not just, as I said, it's not money. It's a career that opens possibilities for you to influence people and to make difference in the world. And that, I think, will, as you grow older, you will discover that that will give you the most satisfaction. You know, once you have enough, and all of you do have enough to eat and you know, the basic needs of life, then it, you discover that's not what makes you happy. It's not. It's not money that makes you happy. What makes you happy is something much more meaningful, much more deep. It is, as I said, sense of ability to help and share and, and be a part of this humanity, you know, and, and get the best out of humanity. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hello. Um, in Egypt, during the Arab Spring, what is your perspective on how social media affected the uprising? Are there negative outcomes or um, positive consequences to social media? I think overall it's positive. Uh, I mean, social media, that's why you are a different generation. I mean, that's why I have a lot of hope in young people, because through social media, through Facebook, Twitter, you know, Instagram, it's, you are instantly connected. Um, you know exactly what is happening everywhere in the world. You get ideas, avalanche of ideas through, through social media. Now, I, of course, the, there are aberration with social media. There are you know, sites that are not, you know, are not good sites. But, uh, but you, one overall, you can always cho choose. And, but I think what you saw, for example, in, in the Arab world, what you saw in Egypt, for example, I mean, it, it was the young people who, re who revolted in 2011, primarily the young people. Basically, we want our dignity. And they were able to do that through the social media. In fact, it was a call to go and demonstrate, orchestrated, coordinated through, through the Facebook. So, it's, it's not a virtual world any longer, the social media. It's a very much part of our life. And the challenge, of course, how to make good use of it. But, uh, but I think overall is great that it makes us feel, again, connected. 
that you can, you know, have a friend in Brazil, you're where you are sitting here, and you know, you interact, and again, you discover that you have a lot in common. So I have a lot of hope because of social media. It makes people aware of the common ground we have. Thank you. Thanks. Um, what can people my age do to make a difference? At your age? <laughs> Just do your homework. <laughs> Uh, but you, but in, in addition, of course, to your homework, again, to try to do as much as you can to help other people. You know, you know, I'm sure you can do whatever in your environment. You know, help a, a young child who is orphaned, for example, a young child who is sick. I mean, it would make a, dif a huge difference, for example, if you go and visit a young child at a hospital or at, at, at an orphanage or if you have something you can help people in need. So even at little things makes huge difference. So always keep that in mind, that, uh, that you are not alone in this world. And there's a lot of people around you in need. And we are blessed and privileged to have the life we have. And we should at least be thankful and try to share it with others. Um, what is your family background and how did that affect your views on global equity or on the issues you talked about today? My family background? My father was a lawyer like me. I mean, we, I, we come from a middle class, so we are, you know, well to do. Uh, how did that affect my views on equity, I think, two ways. I come, I grew up in Egypt, and uh, you know, and with this was and still a lot of poverty, and I felt something is terribly wrong, you know, that some people have and some people do not have, you know. And then when I grew up, I traveled a lot. I spent like 15 years in the United States, and uh, and then again in over 20 some years in Vienna so but during in Austria but during my work you know I traveled you know I had to travel to all different countries of the world and I've, I've seen the huge gap between you know one country and another you know between one city and another between one suburb and another you know and you for some reason I just I got the feeling that it is not right. I mean, it is whether you come and has, whether you are a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Christian, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if you are as a human being with conscience, you will discover that there is something wrong. And at least I have to speak about it, but also act on it. You know, there's a lot of people. You know, you hear a lot about see, about equity and you know fairness and. But are we really doing much about it? We are not, as I, as I mentioned. I mean, I, last year, for example, like around two million people died in Africa because they don't have access to medical care. Medical care that's available, and they could have been alive today. But they died because they don't have access. How do I, f how do I feel good about that? Of course I don't, you know. And uh, so it's, it's not, I think it's, I mean, just seeing the difference, and I'm sure here again in Thailand, you see the difference, you know, between, you know, you see the, the inequality, you know, and the so, as we call it, social justice, you know. You know, obviously not everybody would have the same standard, but at least everybody should have the minimum standard, you know, uh, to be able to, again, to live in dignity. I mean, I, I work with in the National Atomic Energy Agency, and we're, we were working with nuclear weapons and trying to control nuclear weapons, but you know, traveling around, I always I realized that poverty, as I, I keep saying, is the most lethal weapon of mass destruction because it makes people angry, it makes people marginalized, it makes people 
feel injustice, and there is nothing worse than people feel they are not really treated like human beings, and they they get berserk as we see it, you know, in, in, in many ways. They, they once you lost you lose your sense of dignity, you know. Don't then expect the person to act in a rational way. So it is not it's not just an ethical question. It's not just you know because you know I feel my conscious. Of, uh, telling me to do this. It's also now a question of survival. We have to understand that. You know, it's a question of survival because unless we have an environment of peace, I mean, this extremism, this war, this violence will come to haunt us wherever we are. I mean, you have seen recently what happened in Paris, for example. Eh? I mean, it's, you have seen what happened in Nigeria. Hmm? I mean, it, it, you, are, you are not immune anywhere. So it is not just an issue of being a good person. It's an issue also, you know, do we want to continue to survive as a human race? And if we do, we have to do things quite different, quite different in the way we approach equity, social equity. Thanks. Thanks so much. Hi. Um, as I'm sure many people respect you, who do you respect the most? Who? Who do you respect the most? I respect every human being, frankly. I mean, I, you know, I, I respect everybody who is honest, who is decent, who is doing his or her own work. I was, I, I respect the humanity in every one of us, you know, and. Uh, I have no reason not to respect everybody. Uh, even the people who are, you know, straying out of the mainstream, they, they, need to, they need help. They need help. I would not just, you know, try to punish them, but try to treat them, of, obviously, as, as a society, I mean. And, uh, but, so, respect is, is key. Again, a lot of the problems we, are, we have is not, is not based on you know, if we respect each other, we will go out of our way to solve our problems. And if we don't respect each other, we'll try to, f to create problems for in, ev for in every solution. I mean, respect is key to our, to our human interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, you've talked about who inspired you and who you respect. But is there someone specific who has supported you along the way the most? Who had guided me? Um, who has supported you along the way the most? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, of course, uh, supported me. My parents supported me when I was your age. Uh, my university professor, a uh, particular professor who supported me when I went to s doing my graduate work at New York University Law School. Uh, uh, my boss, when I started working, was kind enough to support me. Yeah. So there's a lot, lot of people who, who, who supported me. But the key support, you bring your own. You, know. you are the one who can support yourself the most. I mean, people support you because they see you are supporting yourself. I mean, their support doesn't come from a vacuum. It's support because they know that you are doing your very best. And so do your best, whatever you are doing, and things will fall into place. Don't even think it will fall into place. Thank you. Um, do you have any book or video recommendations about equality? About? Equality. Equality. Well, I, I mean, I think the recommendation is very easy, that every one of us should do as much, you know, to help as much as we can. You know, even if you give a five baht, you know, you know, to somebody in need, it still will make a difference, you know. So if every one of us understand that, you know, we need to help, 
and we should, we should not be selfish, and we should look around us, uh, the world will be a different place. You know, if we are going to tell our politicians that we do not want weapons of war to kill, and if we even fight, we don't have to kill each other, and we don't need weapons that can destroy the entire world, like nuclear weapons. I mean, I think not only that we can, we can do some stuff, you know, ourselves, you know, in our own immediate environment, but we can also be active in society. When you grow up, you have to be active in society. You have to be able to make your, your voice heard in the society of what you want your country or your to look like, or society to look like, in terms of fairness, in terms of equity, in terms of solidarity. Uh, these things are not going to change until every one of us saying that we don't like what we see and we want a different world. So you have to, you have to speak up. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, is there a particular age group that you like to talk to? Sorry? Is there a particular age group that you like to talk to? Age group? Thanks. I mean, I, th I think, and this is not a compliment, it's your age group, because you are, you are at the time, you are still, you know, open to ideas, open to different way of thinking, you know. It's more difficult to speak to your age group because you have to explain a lot of backgrounds, but it is what I feel is the most uh, fulfilling to, to speak to younger generation. The last three months I was in Boston in the US, I was teaching, lecturing at Fletcher School, Harvard, MIT, and again, it was extremely satisfying, you know trying to be with young people all the time and try, and try to interact with them. And you learn a lot from them. Uh, you, know, you learn a lot because every generation comes with different ideas, comes with different thoughts. So yeah, I'd like, I'd, it, it makes me feel fulfilled, makes me feel younger possibly, but your generation, because I see the future in your generation. I don't look back when I talk to you. I look, to, I look forward and that's a nice feeling. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we have time for one more question. I know some eighth grade maybe um, had, had a question. If uh, did you always plan to do what you are doing now whenever you were younger? Not at all. I didn't. Actually, I, I mean, life takes you in certain direction. All I know that I have to do to be good in whatever I'm doing. So when I was going to school, the law school, uh, when I was started working at the, at the diplomat at the beginning, when I joined the United Nations, you know, you always have to. But whether this was planned was not at all. I mean, all I know that I wanted to study law. You know, that is, and I wanted to join the Foreign Service because I was interested again in discovering the world, you know. You, it just the sense of curiosity to, to be able to see the different parts of the world. But how things develop, it was all, was not planned. So you can't, as I said, you do your best at whatever you want to do, you know. And don't expect that things will go, will fit exactly the way you want it. But it will end up right at the end. We again would like to thank Dr. Albardai for coming to us <laughs> to share his views with us. Dr. Albardai, as a token of our appreciation, we would like to present you a gift.
We would now like to call upon all the students who had a question prepared for Dr. Albaradai to come to the stage at this time for a photo.